Hi everyone, welcome to today's webinar, State of the Consumer, From Influence to Impact, Strategies for Memorable Content. For anyone who may not know me yet, I'm Katie Gross, Chief Customer Officer at Suzy, and I'm excited to bring our topic to life this afternoon. Today's webinar is going to start off with a trends report detailing consumer feelings about influencers and the brands they collaborate with. Immediately following the report, I'm gonna lead a panel discussion with a series of experts that will help you understand how your brand can help you make the most of influencer marketing. In a few minutes, I'll be joined on the virtual stage by Sammy Lambert, Director of Social Media at Adweek, Sanya Chowdhury, Research Coordinator, Entertainment and Culture Marketing at United Talent Agency, Dana Cowell, Senior Director of Brand Marketing and Innovation at Bumblebee Foods, and Crystal Hauserman, Chief Marketing and Growth Officer and Strategic Advisor. How lucky am I to host a panel of heroes of the industry. But first, let's meet the other woman in my life, Susie. For any new folks on today's call that may not be familiar with us, Susie is an end-to-end -end consumer insights platform. We integrate AI-powered quant, qual, and high-quality audiences into a single connected research cloud. And for today's study, we used Susie to pulse a thousand consumers about all things influencers. The sample was census weighted across age, gender, ethnicity, and region. So let's find out what they had to say. Why is this topic so important? Well, influencer marketing had an estimated market size of only 1.7 billion back in 2016. With a boost to in influencer content during the COVID pandemic in 2020, particularly thanks to platforms like TikTok, the market size skyrocketed to $16.4 billion by the end of 2022. And keeping on this trajectory, it's expected to keep growing, reaching $24 billion by the end of 2024. And 41% of consumers said that they have made past purchases based on influencer recommendations. I know I have purchased everything from swimwear to winter coats to concert tickets and skincare. Despite the strong purchase numbers and the expected market growth, there's still a gap to growth when it comes to consumers connecting with influencers, especially in the age of AI and with the rise in trends like de-influencing. So for the next few minutes, I'm going to explore three primary questions to help you understand the current state of influencer marketing. First, we're going to look at what types of influencers consumers are connecting with and why. Then we're going to take a deeper dive into what makes influencers and the brands they collaborate with appear authentic. And finally, we'll uncover whether or not de-influencing is a trend and do we need to be worried about it? So let's jump right into section one. From celebs to micro-influencers, who do consumers connect with and why? Our insight here is that the follower count of the influencer your brand is working with is important, but not as important as that personal connection that's being created. Because there are all different types of influencers out there. So let's break this down for you. Mega. These influencers have over a million followers. Think celebrities like The Rock, or folks that started as influencers and became celebrities, like James Charles and Addison Rae, who started out with dances on TikTok and now crossed into the acting realm. Next, there's Macro, and these influencers still have a major following, but haven't quite reached mega status yet. This group has between 100,000 and 1 million followers. There are a plethora of influencers in this group, but an example is Janae Brown, who has capitalized on her following to produce authentic sponsored posts in the areas of home decor and mind and body wellness. Next up, there's micro. And micro influencers have captured a lot of attention recently. They have between 10 and 100,000 followers. And while their follower account may not be huge, their fan base is loyal. We'll dive a little deeper in a couple of minutes into this emerging cohort. Nano is next. Nano influencers have between 1,000 and 10,000 followers, but they have some of the highest engagement amongst their followers. 
With a smaller follower base, people trust the recommendations of these influencers. The coupling of authenticity and enthusiasm has, has made these small voices resonate strongly in their loyal followers. And finally, niche. Niche influencers influence their audience on one specific topic or subject only, whether it's fitness, plant care, pottery, RV living, health, or more. Niche influencers are arguably the most trusted by their audience in terms of purchase recommendations, since their message is succinct, consistent, and easily demonstrated through all of their feeds. And when we think about mega influencers, we naturally think about celebrities. And for a good reason, because 53% of those we surveyed have purchased a product because it's associated with a mega celebrity. And a prime example of this mega celeb success is Rare Beauty and Selena Gomez. Gomez is the founder and owner of this massive beauty brand that sold $70 million worth of blush alone in 2022. She regularly shares Rare Beauty news to her 428 million Instagram followers, and the brand taps into Gomez's passion for mental health via its Rare Impact Fund. Celebrities also impact brand perception. 31% said that a celebrity product endorsement impacts their perception of that product's quality or value. And a great example of this is, of course, Kim Kardashian's shapewear brand, Skims. It is known for creating impressive brand deals that equate to perceived product quality and earn an impressive $2.1 million for each and every social post. Fox has even dubbed Skims, the Skims ad, the new Vogue cover, with the likes of Usher, Lana Del Rey, and more taking part in these ads. And I will say also that that product is incredible, so kudos to product development. We already shared that just over half of consumers have already made a purchase from a celebrity endorsed product. But we also learned that 28% are more likely to purchase celebrity endorsed products over those that have been endorsed by non-celebrity influencers. And our final celebrity brand spotlight is an example of just that. Terramana is a small batch tequila brand that was founded by Dwayne The Rock Johnson in partnership with Mars Jägermeister. Terramana became the fastest premium spirits brand in 2023 to sell 1,000,000 9-litre cases within a 12-month period here in the USA alone. So, should we all just hire The Rock to represent our brands and watch our revenues soar? The Rock wearing skims? <laughs> Maybe not. Because we do have evidence that consumers may be feeling some fatigue when it comes to the all important celebrity influencing. And they're feeling over the oversaturation across industries. The top celeb endorsed industry is also the one where we're seeing the most fatigue with 61% of consumers citing celebrity oversaturation in beauty and skincare. Other areas of oversaturation include fashion and apparel at 50%, fitness and wellness at 39%, food and beverage at 31%, and health and supplements at 33%. And an example of just this is Beyonce and Adidas's Ivy Park partnership. Despite 2023 being a huge year for Beyonce as an artist with the success of her Renaissance World Tour, this did not help Ivy Park sales, and unfortunately that partnership didn't last. Reach only goes so far with celebrities. The biggest impact comes from direct brand involvement. Only 29% of consumers believe that celebrities actually use the products that they endorse. Successful celebrity brands thrive when there's a real passion behind the venture rather than just a name being attached. Additionally, the practicality of integrating these products into daily life plays a significant role. Skims fits into everyday wear, whereas a gold mesh dress from, dress from Ivy Park might not quite fit the bill. Essentially, the most significant celebrity impact stems from their direct involvement and the product's rele relevance to everyday life. When it comes to smaller influencers, tapping into their personal authenticity may be even more impactful for brand collaborations than those with celebrities. 
45% of consumers find niche or micro influencers to be extremely impactful in their purchase decisions. The follower count may be lower, but that reach within the followers is key. And a great example of this is hers. To promote their hair and skincare products on TikTok, hers worked with Gen Z influencers with a particular focus on those who have been creating content about their hair and skincare journeys already. Their hair campaign generated more than 1.4 million impressions over just 30 days. And this impact is huge across niche influencers too. From beauty talk to book talk to food talk, consumers are increasingly engaged in niche spaces online. Reddit alone has over 140,000 subreddits, each dedicated to a unique topic. And there are even Slack channels committed to various topics. Each offers an opportunity for brands to find niche audiences and partner with influencers that run in those spaces already. And 52% of people choose to follow certain accounts online based on the niche content that they offer and the value they bring to their topics of interest. And we have a great quote from Forbes on this subject on screen. They wrote in a recent article, oftentimes when we use micro influencers for our clients, we see higher engagement rates because those influencers not only have a more personal relationship with their followers, but also accept products and brands they know will resonate with their audiences. The niches that brands should pay attention to according to consumers are mental health and well-being, health and wellness technology, sustainable products, education and skill building, and community-centric niches. Smaller influencers also allow brands to showcase more diversity, and 42% of consumers find it important that brands engage with a diverse range of influencers. One brand that we love that does this incredibly well is Elf Cosmetics. They tap into multiple smaller creators, enabling them to connect with consumers across all demographics. Elf Collabs have included the It Gets Better project to feature LGBTQ influencers and creators, hosting events for Black History and AAPI History Months and more. And to round out this section, our so what here is whether we work, whether you work with celebrities or niche influencers, it's critical to tap into influencers that are personally connected to your brand, its mission and your niche. This brings us to section two. What makes an influencer or brand appear authentic? Our second insight of the afternoon is that creating genuine personal interactions and transparent sponsorship with content creators will help your brand read as authentic. Approximately six in 10 respondents agree that influencers genu genuinely use and believe in the products they promote, signaling moderate confidence in influencer authenticity. But how can brands improve consumer confidence when it comes to these collabs? The first step is to identify the right influencer to work with. We went over the different types of influencers in section one. So for section two, we're gonna unpack authenticity drivers. So what makes an influencer authentic? Let's let consumers tell it themselves. We asked how consumers know whether or not an influencer is being authentic. And 56% of them said the most important thing was sharing transparency in partnerships and sponsorships. At 47%, we had sharing a personal experience and opinions. And rounding out our top drivers at 42% was genuine engagement with their audience. So starting with the top driver, transparency. This is not only a consumer need, this is the absolute baseline for all brands from both a consumer trust angle and for basic legal compliance. If you're not transparent about your business practices, you could end up in some tricky legal waters. Our survey also identified personal experience as an important authenticity driver. And a brand that does a great job of this is Pattern Beauty. Their creator squad program invites people to share their curly hair journeys, which can be highly personal. Plus it's owned by Tracy Alice Ross 
a celeb who most definitely fits into the mega influencer category. And our third driver, genuine engagement, is arguably the trickiest one. In order to come across as genuine, you need to be genuine. <laughs> it takes time to build brand equity and faking it or working with influencers that are faking it themselves is gonna get caught pretty quickly by consumers. The one thing that consumers don't consider authentic just yet is AI. 53% of consumers feel negative or skeptical about AI influencers, while another 28% are neutral. And I follow a lot of AI home decor. <laughs> in some ways, AI already goes hand in hand with social media. I think it's safe to say we've all used AI enhanced filters at one time or another, but the mistrust goes in, comes into play because AI influencers don't have a way to genuinely speak to their audience or to genuinely talk about their experiences because they have them. The chart on screen shows the industries perceived to be the least authentic up to the most authentic. On the least authentic side, we have things like wellness, fashion, and beauty. These lower ranking industries have so much conflicting cons influencer content out there that it's hard for consumers to really cut through all of the noise. There's also a lack of regulation around claims that are popular in these categories. As any beauty brand, for example, can call themselves green, or does even have green packaging, without actually meeting any of the set criteria. Fitness falls right in the middle. And travel, technology and food rank at the top. When it comes to our top authentic industry, food, viewers are watching a mix of cooking recipes, lifestyle content, tutorials, and product reviews. And since products can be more naturally ingrained into cooking videos, it's easier to trust them. A creator name dropping a kitchen aid in their pasta making tutorial, for example, feels less like they're selling, selling you a product and more like it really is the product that's part of their everyday life. A brand that does a good job of this, one of my personal favorites, is Duncan. They've spent decades building up their brand equity with slogans like America runs on Duncan and have since integrated fun solutions for ways consumers can fit their line of at-home products into their everyday lives. Hashtag Duncan at home taps cooking influencers to spice up existing items in recipes while adding personal flair. They include ways to fancy up your home coffee for instance, by making an ice drink with whipped cream. This makes for more fun and more personalized collabs and it's delicious. Our so what for section two is that authenticity requires both a brand and the influencer they work with to be open, honest, and real. And that means be cautious of AI for now. This brings us to our final section. Is de-influencing a trend to be worried about? For anyone who might not know, de-influencing is a trend where creators discourage consumers from buying various products across industries. Our third insight today is that de-influencing isn't actually as scary as it sounds. At the end of the day, consumers really just want more conscious consumption. And with 82% of people thinking the influencer industry is oversaturated, the constant push to consume can be overwhelming. On top of that, we're seeing more and more non-influencer ads appear in social channels, from Instagram stories to TikTok. Ads, influence, influencers and collabs are everywhere and consumers are really feeling it. The authenticity that we talked about in section two becomes so important to stand out from the crowd and beat those oversaturation blues. Because more than a third of respondents have already disengaged from influencers they once followed due to oversaturation. The skews are stronger among women with 40, 41% saying they've unfollowed versus 30% of, of men saying that they've done the same. And nearly half of consumers are feeling pressured to buy more products from influencer promotions. This comes into play even more when you've followed someone for a long time or generally like their content. You almost feel an obligation to support them and their partnership. A lot of influencers are transparent, this is their job, and supporting the products they promote is akin to buying an album from your favorite singer. So this is also why we're seeing more and more headlines about de-influencing. Instead of buying more, 
de-influencing encourages consumers to buy less, but it doesn't encourage them to stop buying entirely. Often de-influencers will share a product they don't think are worth purchasing, but will often give you a dupe, AKA a cheaper or different yet similar product to buy as an alternative instead. And some argue that de-influencing is actually just a more conscious form of influencing. It helps consumers make more informed decisions about what they do buy. As the quote on screen from the US Chamber of Commerce says, de-influencing isn't the end of a brand. It's an opportunity to listen to consumers and adjust your product or your messaging. And one brand that's doing really well is Lululemon. To battle dupes in their aligned leggings, Lululemon hosted a dupe swap to show the superior quality of their product. Lululemon reports that 50% of, of people who attended the swap were new customers. And half of the attendees were also under the age of 30. So instead of fighting against dupes, they accepted that they were part of the culture and they had fun with it. They leaned into core understanding about brand perception and had such high confidence in their product and how the people were going to respond. Another way to work with the influencers, not against them, is to address consumers' concerns. In the Lululemon example from the previous slide, they address a possible perception that dupes of their products were better and sought to prove that what they offered could not be beat. Consumer concerns that lead to de-influencing tend to focus on quality, price and sustainability. So addressing those concerns head on can help build trust. 71% of consumers agree that influencer culture is contributing to overconsumption. And this percentage rises to 78% amongst 18 to 24 year olds. Gen Z in particular is very aware of sustainability when it comes to products. We see the headline here about regretting sheen hauls. We've been seeing somewhat of a shift from fast fashion to slow fashion. People are still consuming fashion items, but looking for pieces that will fit into a capsule wardrobe and are a higher quality and therefore made to last longer. And 60% of consumers are more inclined to purchase from a brand if they partner with influencers who promote sustainable consumption. We again see this rise among 18 to 24 year olds, this time at 67%. And our next de-influencing brand spotlight is my personal favorite. I think I own every single one of their products. It is popular skincare brand CeraVe. Their tactics include using dermatologists as influencers and encouraging thoughtful consumption of their products. CeraVe is less trendy. I mean, just look at the packaging than many other skincare brands that are out there. But that's to its benefit in de-influencing. Having experts come in and say, you don't need a $50 sunscreen or an $80 moisturizer, this is all you need, works. And trust me, the product is fantastic. It works. Did I just become a de-influencer? So how can brands take back de-influencing? There are a few different ways. Calling in expert opinions, promoting through thoughtful consumption, and spinning negative attention into trust, trust building actions, can really help brands when it comes to the de-influencing trend. Because at the end of the day, consumers know influencer marketing is here to stay. 54% of consumers believe that the role of influencers in product advertising and sales is a long-term trend that will continue to influence marketing strategies and their purchasing. And the brands that succeed will be the ones that consumers trust. So our final so what is that consumers want to see influencers and brands that prioritize sustainability and most importantly, transparency. So with that, I'd like to welcome my very special guest panelists on stage to unpack this. So please feel free to pop questions into the chat. I'd like to ask our panel to join here. Hi, Sonia. Hi, Crystal. Hi, Sammy. Hi, Tina. Awesome. All right. Let's kick things off, ladies. Let's get to know each other a little bit better. So if you could please tell the audience a little bit about your about yourself and your relationship to influencer marketing. Crystal, we'll start with you. Yes. Katie, first of all, uh, thank you for running through all, <laughs> all of that. It's good to see you all 
summarized so beautifully and clearly um, for everybody. So I'm super excited to be here today for this session. So thank you to you, Katie, the Susie team, and also this awesome conversation with all the smart women here. She Rose, I think you called it. I love that. I'm, I'm stealing that. Um, look, I, I first began working with influencers, creators um, as VP of marketing at Full Screen in 2017. Um, we worked with tens of thousands of the world's top creators, Mr. Beast, Zach King, um, the list goes on and on. And Katie, as you noted earlier, the, the influencer marketing business at that time was a, was a few billion dollar business, still substantial, um, but really having witnessed the growth, uh, which slated to surpass $24 billion by the end of this year. Uh, as you said, it's not going anywhere. I think how it evolves and changes, I'm excited to get into with everybody here. Uh, in my career, I've led teams across entertainment, sports, gaming, celebrity businesses, um, helping brands like the NBA, Taco Bell, L'Oreal, uh, many more captivate, really figure out how to captivate consumers, mostly focused on Gen Z through the power of influencers and creators. My most favorite recent campaign, my teams worked with a team at Hilton Hotels uh, on the now infamous 10 minute TikTok. Uh, it was the first brand to kind of come in and do something on the platform in that way at a 10 minute format. We cast seven TikTok native talent and really built this irreverent script with a fantastic team over at Shia Day uh, that poked fun at everyone from creators selling out to brands to Airbnb hosts that have crazy lists of things you have to do on checkout to out of touch ad executives. Um, and the impact of that campaign was just massive from uh, you know 35 million views on the TikTok itself, 100, almost $130 million in earned media talking about the campaign. It was shortlisted for a Cam Lion Award. It just in April this year won Ad Age's Social Campaign of the Year, um, but really had measurable results for, for Hilton. You know, they, 100,000 people signed up for the sweepstakes, um, 55,000 new signups for their honors program. And so really still, you know, in this current day of how really smart creative strategy, bringing creators in, sometimes it's even making fun of creator culture can still really have massive impact and really break through to consumers. So excited to talk about all things uh, creators, influencers with the rest of the panel. Wow. Crystal, what we'll start and hate to use the word brave, but like how brave to do 10 minutes and it paid off. Look at that impact. Yeah. Awesome. Sammy, we'd love you to introduce yourself to the audience. Hi, everybody. I'm Sammy. I'm the director of social at Adweek. I've been working in social for maybe 12 years now, mostly on the entertainment side and for publications. So I'm not usually on the brand side. However, with Adweek, obviously creators have disrupted the whole marketing industry. So we've been reporting a lot about it. And also um, I've interviewed a ton of creators about their brand partnerships at events. I actually, Crystal is so crazy. I moderated a, moderated a panel about that Hilton. Um, TikTok with the creator that was in it and the agency and someone from Hilton at social media two years ago. So such a small world, so fun. Full circle. <laughs> yeah, such a full circle moment. Um, but yeah, the creator economy has definitely disrupted this entire industry. It's been so cool to see. I love that the power has been kind of given back to individual people instead of like big brands sometimes. And um, yeah, I love working with creators. I've collaborated with a bunch of them and it's interesting to hear the creator side of things too, in addition to the brand and agency side. Awesome. Sonia, over to you. Hi everyone. I'm super excited to be here. Thank you, Katie. Thank you, Suzy team for having me. And I'm super excited to be learning from all of these amazing panelists as well. Um, my name is Sonia Chowdhury. I lead research and insights as NextGen. We were formerly Juve Consulting and now are a part of United Talent Agency's entertainment and cultural marketing practice. Um, we've helped brands like L'Oreal, Coach, Google, and more connect with young, diverse audiences. Um, Juve Consulting, now NextGen, what initiative that 
started by a group of passionate Gen Zers um, that were tired of being talked about and at um, and instead of to and with. And so since its inception, we've worked with top brands to bridge that gap um, between marketing teams and Gen Z consumers. Uh, one of those key areas has obviously been uh, the world of influencer marketing and really helping companies understand what resonates with this generation. Um, when it comes to our relationship with influencers, Gen Z's really value community transparency and convenience like we want our creators to be telling us something and not selling us um, being able to relate to the person on our screen whether that's the way that they look what they value or their sense of humor ultimately what we're really looking for from the creators that we follow is connection and community so super excited to be here and excited to continue talking about influencers Awesome. And Tanya, I love that phrase that you used, tired of being talked about and at, and want to be talked to and with. It's a key phrase I love there. All right, last but not least, Dana. Awesome. Hi, guys. Thanks for having me. My name is Dana Kowal. I'm the Senior Brand Director at Bumblebee Seafood Company. Prior to Bumblebee, I worked at PepsiCo um, for a while, and then I worked in technology for 14 years prior to that with Hewlett Packard. So I've seen kind of B2B marketing, B2C marketing, and really lived on the corporate and more brand side of it. Um, so I'm excited to talk about this because I think, you know, in the early days of marketing, influencers weren't really a thing. And as you all have noted, they've really changed how content gets created, how it reaches consumers, and how it impacts consumers. And I think it's actually become more creative over time, which is the fun that I'm seeing in it, right? As you allow makers to do their thing, embrace your brand, embrace your products, and help amplify your message. I think it's really shifted the industry um, and is helping a lot of us just enjoy more of what we're watching and engage. Oh, awesome. Dana, I love a chocolate advent calendar. So the fact that I'm seeing a tuna lover's advent calendar really is making me uh, laugh and is also making me hungry. <laughs> okay, so what trends are defining the current state of influencer marketing? And Sammy, we'll start with you. I feel like traditionally we've been seeing um, brands have just been really a lot better at um, partnering with creators who align with their brand. I think in the beginning it was like kind of like no one really knew what they were doing. Now I think they've really got that down. Um, I think someone who's doing this in a way that's a little more unconventional is Mark Jacobs right now. Is like collaborating with the craziest um, creators. Oh. I'm hearing someone come in, but I don't know. Um, is collaborating with like the craziest creators right now. I think they're doing this a little bit differently, and I'm seeing that. I, I'm assuming that that's going to be a trend that's coming up. Is like taking maybe the not so obvious route. Um, but making sure that your audience still aligns. So I think that's a trend that I'm going to be looking out for soon. Awesome. Very fun. Anybody else or any kind of trends that you're currently seeing in the, the current state? Yeah, Katie, I'll add one here. I think, you know, those of us who've been, you know, kind of in this orbit for a while now, we, we know, and as you covered in the presentation, look, wellness, fashion, beauty, those have always been kind of the, uh, where critical mass of, influencer marketing has occurred. But also what I found really interesting in the trend report you shared is like, that's where they're the least um, trusted, <laughs> uh, which is, is interesting and, and not that surprising. But one of the trends that I see, which I think I'm really excited about is how industries outside of those kind of core are really starting to flex and experiment with the power of influencers and creators. So you think of things like personal finance, banking, education, e-learning. And to me, that's a trend as, as the industry has grown, these brands that not didn't maybe traditionally understand how they might show up using influencers. I think that's a really cool trend. You've seen you know, business influencers on TikTok kind of like take off. And so this whole new era of you think about it in the early days, what it used to be is someone doing like get, get ready with me sort of videos and that we've just evolved so much. And I think that's really exciting. Yeah, definitely. Those early kind of YouTube videos of like putting the makeup on with me have definitely come a long, long way. Um, you're so right on the business influencers. There's a sales influencer called Corporate Pro that my team actually got me a, a little birthday video of uh, a couple of years ago, which I replay on my birthday every year. Yeah. And marketing influencers. I'll give a shout for Girl Boss Town, who is one of the talent in the, actually the 10 minute TikTok. But I love her because she's constantly 
uh, spitting out ideas of how brands can show up better with influencers. And it's one of the, my favorite trends of how we've evolved. And I think Dana kind of said, like, in the early days, it was like, hey, we're paying you money, show up, shoot at this camera angle, here's the script, deliver us that piece of content. And now we're in this like 3.0 where it's really the talent really collaborating and partnering with the brand and saying like, how can we build like a whole platform of how you can show up more authentically? And, and I look at an influencer like her who just really um, is doing it. It's very cool. Yeah. Sonia, you had mentioned um, one of the kind of key trends you're seeing is talking about an at um, versus kind of to and with. And we have an audience question from Alicia. Um, this is something that she would very much like to see, um, but what kind of, you know, do you have examples of what you've seen that be done really well? Yeah, that's a really good question. I mean, a lot of the work that we do with brands is focused on centering Gen Z voices. And so we facilitate things like advisory councils and focus groups where we're bringing actual Gen Z consumers to the table with VPs of marketing and having those open conversations about what they want to see from the brand. And from those conversations come really, really innovative, creative ideas that actually re resonate with Gen Z consumers because they're coming straight from, from them. Yeah, absolutely. I saw a trend that was about instead of mentorship in the workplace, kind of like the reverse mentorship of Gen Z actually talking to the to the senior leaders instead. Um, so let's cover a little bit to like what trends do we think are fading right now? And Sonia, we'll go we'll go back to you. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I wouldn't say fading completely, but I think that when it comes to Gen making purchasing decisions in the past couple of years we've really started leaning away from macro creators and celebrities trying to tell us what to buy and are looking to creators that feel closer to home um, so this is where the ugc and micro creators come in we see ugc as trusted community-based content and less institutional than macro influencer work um, we still love creators with larger followings um, but their impact is only felt when they have a very clear established niche so like rihanna with beauty or emma, emma chamberlain with coffee without that segmentation their branded videos sometimes feel like inauthentic or generic um, and just less trustworthy so definitely thinking that traditional celebrity marketing has changed a lot in the past couple of years but it's also not going away altogether anytime soon. Yeah, for sure. So let's focus on those kind of brand collapse um, and beyond. What criteria do you think, and there was a question from the audience on this too, what criteria should brands really consider when they're selecting the influencers that they should be collaborating with? And Sammy, we'll start with you. I think it needs to be a super, super um, transparent and easy collaboration. If this, if the influencers are already talking about the product, using the product in their daily life, or it aligns um, in a way that's extremely seamless, that's definitely where you should start. You can also, I mean, data is at our fingertips. Like you should be looking at their audience and seeing what their audience is talking about. The comment sections on things like TikTok are amazing places to start. Like there's entire jokes and narratives and stories that happen within um, creators comment sections that brands should pay attention to. It's not just the video. There's like inside jokes that people can really tap into. And I think that's like the key. Um, I know someone asked a question about like what you do for a gas station. Obviously there's not a lot of influencers you're like talking about their gas, but in that case, there's a lot of influencers who post from their cars and I would kind of tap on that where they're always in their car and like some, be like, maybe you can get out of your car. Maybe you can be pumping some gas. Maybe there's people who go on road trips. Like I would kind of take that route because a lot of people do um, things with their cars. Sorry, I just answered the question. I also, I know we're focusing so much on TikTok, but other platforms have influencers and especially when doing B2B or other, um, I don't know, not skincare, beauty and fashion, it's sometimes um, important to look at like Reddit or LinkedIn is having like a pretty robust creator program and they're testing video on their platform. Like there's so many other platforms that each have their own um, content creators, even though like I love TikTok and I love TikTokers. And sometimes that is like the go-to um, to think outside the box when trying to figure out who to work with is really important too. Yeah. I love that. I hope that helped. We're like live consulting with our audience. This is fantastic. Yeah. No, and I think Sammy's point of like find find the talent that's already talking about you. I think one of my favorite examples of that, and everybody I know everybody will know what it is, it's you know, EOS kind of writing the bless your effing cooch <laughs> uh, train. Uh, Soyoung Kang over there, the CMO at EOS, uh, you know, really finding, you know, this content being created by a creator, Carly Joe, who is just creating it organically, 
kind of on her own and, and quite as, and as, as so young shared before, like wasn't even really interested, wasn't searching for a brand collab with EOS and actually it took some coaxing to come in and be part of that. And so I think that's a really, it's smart and can't be overstated. Like who's already, who's already in your fandom? Like who's already really authentically there and something I know Sonia team Juve now artist formerly known as Juve now UTA next gen. Um, to me, that criteria is really about looking for talent and creators that you can build from a brand perspective. The day, the era of a one-off relationship is really kind of over. And I think, you know, the team at NextGen talks a lot about, you know, co-creation. How do we build like a platform, like an evergreen relationship and really, you know, bringing that in and approaching it in that way. And really the days of a transactional relationship are, are quite over. I also think with that also comes the ability when things go sideways, as we've all witnessed and seen in the last few years, that brand really um, owning the responsibility to uh, come to the protection and defense mm -hmm. and protection of those creators that they have brought into their ecosystem. I think that becomes a lot easier equation when it's a relationship and not a one-off um, thing. Yeah, that's so important for sure. Um, and I also think, you know, Sammy, to kind of do what you had mentioned, it's it's not just about the video itself, but what's in the comments, um, which I, help, I think it helps build FOMO because often I see jokes that I'm like, wait, what did I miss in culture today? <laughs> so. Um, so we're talking about that kind of uh, authentic voices and the relationships, et cetera. So what advice do we have for how brands and influencers can really maintain that authentic voice while that collaboration is happening? And Dana, do you have examples of that? Oh, you might have a little trouble with your audio, Dana. I was thinking of how you can tell I think we have some cross wires. <laughs> we'll come back. We'll come back to you, Dana. Hopefully, we can uh, we can figure it out. Um, but Sammy, do you have kind of any thoughts there on how we can maintain some of those authentic voices in the club? Yeah, authenticity is kind of. I mean, I don't know if it's because I've been to a million ad week events and corporate conferences, but authenticity is one of those words that's like so overused to the point where like, what does it even mean anymore? Although I do love like we, we have to be authentic and. The creators have to be authentic. The brand does, but like, what does it actually mean? Um, I think actually, and like Gen Z's, the they can sniff out when someone's not being themselves, like from the absolute first second. And um, you really have to pick people who are, or pick like brands pick people or brands being themselves. Like you really have to just be yourself. And I know that's so cliche. I don't even know how else to describe it, but you can tell when someone's being like reading a script or saying something they wouldn't normally say or um, doing something just for the check. And it's like the audience are supporting them. They're like, yes, get that bag, but they're not actually believing them. And that's not going to lead to conversions, you know? So I think really picking people who like you see other brand deals that they've done and you can almost not even tell when it's a brand deal. And I think those are the best ones. It kind of has to blend into their other content. Um, and again, this just goes back to making sure you're choosing people who really, really align with your brand. And sometimes it's not even about the product. It's about your values, your morals, the transparency you have with your, um, with your audience and with your uh, customers. And I think creators are like really, really uh, looking into that a lot more now. And so are younger audiences. So I know I'm not Gen Z. I know you guys thought I was, but I'm not. Um, but I know younger people now actually really do care about sustainability, about political issues. And even if you're selling a product that has nothing to do with those things, you, your morals and values have to align with that. And um, picking people or working with people who also agree with those topics is really important. Um, yeah, maybe you guys can speak more on authenticity. <laughs> but yeah. I don't know if maybe. I was too too rude about the word, but I've just heard no, it so no. Much. <laughs> I feel the same way. You had total echo. It's this word we use all the time, but when we stop, we're like, what does it really mean? But one of the keys, I think, how it shows up, instead of trying to define it, it's when a brand lets, and I think um, somebody said it earlier, it's like, let the creators create. Right. And I think, look, it takes a little bit of guts on the brand side to let go of the <laughs> let go of the reins. I think the team, Corey and, and Patrick O'Keefe's team over at Elf Beauty do an incredible job of 
bringing creators in and saying, run, you know how to talk to your audience. You know how to engage them. You know how to speak to them um, transparently from personal experience in a way that's really genuine with, over a product that you're really excited about. That's the key, right? I think when it's very, when the brands come in so hot over the top and still, there are still brands today with brand safety measures and all these things that are just so constructed about, well, you know, influencer, they can't say this and they can't say that. We got to take that out. And I think, look, you, if you're, if you're going down that lane and you want it to be um, effective, it's that balance. You really have to let go of, of the reins and kind of let them create. To me, that's how authenticity manifests. Yeah. It's like with the podcast advertising, when I kind of hear the, uh, <laughs> when I hear people just reading a script, I'm like, eh, okay. But then when I hear, you know, the, the podcasters using their own terminology, their own voice, weaving it into what their podcast is about. It's really, really, it's nice. It's so much better. There was a question from the audience actually almost on this exact topic um, with Rihanna. Obviously she found very much her niche with Fenty Beauty, but do you think she's found that kind of same niche and authenticity with the laundry brand, Savage? Sonia, I think you were the one that had mentioned um, Rihanna. Yeah, that's a really good question. I don't know that she has. I don't know that anything can match what Fenty did, um, at least in, in its first couple years. Um, I think the the real selling point with Fenty was that it came out during a time where there were not there weren't a lot of brands that were doing that diverse of a range of color in, in their products. And I think she came in at just the perfect time and introduced a product that really touched on those Gen Z values of like inclusivity. Um, and, and I think that that is something that might be hard to recreate with um, the lingerie brand. Yeah, for sure. Um, all right, so let's look at the, the bigger picture because obviously influencers just, are just one part of a marketing campaign. So how are you seeing influencers being integrated into that kind of larger marketing campaign successfully? And Sam, we'll start with you on this one. Um, I've been seeing, and I love this, when influencers are used in out-of-home campaigns, on television campaigns, in retail media, but in a way that really speaks to still online culture. I think some brands get it wrong where they'll pop in like a famous TikToker into a traditional TV commercial. Personally, I don't think that's the best use of um, influencer marketing in other marketing uh, vehicles. I feel like you need to really lean in and you can use a TikToker or a meme or a creator and just pop in the same similar video, I would say, or similar type of content and just push it to out of home and push it to TV. The consumer's gonna get it. People are smarter than you think they are. And um, I think that's the best way to kind of integrate influencer marketing. Also, I think when you work with influencers, like it is risky. We have to like play, you have to play, you have to risk it. Um, going back to what Crystal was saying, like you have to kind of let them do what they wanna do. And I think this translates also to using influencers in ways that we're not really used to. And I think brands who really get that right, like you see clothing companies now they're putting like UGC and influencer content straight on their website. That was pretty risky in the beginning. They're like, people don't want a non photo shoot on when they're buying something, but like, actually, no, they act, they do want that. And that can be used. I mean, I saw a question about healthcare. Like this could be used anywhere. People like other people and people like other people that they trust. They trust these people that they have these parasocial relationships online and brands just have to be a little riskier and have a little bit more fun when um, doing this kind of work. Cause you for, breaking the rules and playing by a new rule book. And I think, yeah, I'm, I'm, it's so fun to be in this space because you really do get to see like the most creative type of people, but you also see brands who are playing it like so, so safe, who have these huge budgets and access to amazing talent. And you're like, you're playing it way too safe for all of this, you know? Yeah, for sure. <laughs> So, Sonia, I'd love to hear a little bit more about how UTA is facilitating or kind of matching influencers with brands. What type of insights can you share? Yeah. Um, so, as a talent agency, we have an incredibly rich pool of athletes, artists, actors, creatives that we can pull from when we're working with brands. And so, the Next Gen team specifically works very closely with our brands to come up with the best ideas and then match the right talent. So, for example, we'll come up with um, an idea for a brand to launch a campaign targeted at Gen Z consumers and then offer recommendations, both UTA and other agency talent that really resonate with Gen Z to be the face of that campaign. Um, our goal is really 
really uh, to pair opportunities with the best talent. And so sometimes that means looking beyond our own pool. Um, and then creators and influencers are definitely a part of that conversation. We've seen very large brands opt for social media creators over celebrities because there's that deep connection with the audience. Um, so overall, I think this is very much brand and talent focused, ensuring that you know we're creating value for everyone involved. I love that. Um, a lot of Gen Z talk, and it was my birthday yesterday. I'm a proud Gen Xer, and I feel like we're very much ignored these days. <laughs> <laughs> so, Dana, bring in the kind of brand marketing if, if you're back on. I think we're still trying to connect with Dana. We'll ask a question at the end. Hopefully, we can get her back in. So, Chris, I'll go over to you. Um, you've obviously worked on the brand side of the house um, here in a variety of roles. So, how have you collaborated with influencers across brands differently, coming kind of from SMB through to enterprise? Yeah, I think look, we talked about Hilton Hotels already, which was a very, very exciting uh, one of the, you know one of the best examples of of kind of how when it works and works really well. Um, you know, I've worked also. I think, content houses you know uh, a couple years ago i was tapped by the nba um and this was a really creative exercise it was in the middle of the pandemic and you couldn't do traditional sorts of influencer activations we couldn't invite a bunch of influencers to a game and create content and so thinking about that challenge it was like well how can we really drive tune in of the of the playoffs this year really get gen z to be excited about watching basketball on tv and we had some baseline insights that said the casual Gen Z fan that might be lured in to watch, uh, actually the path to reach them was through food, <laughs> music, culture, streetwear, street fashion. And so really kind of thinking, taking all that into account, we came up with this really creative idea to bring in 15 of the world's top talent. We brought a lot of, a lot of talent in from UTA actually, and the other major talent agencies. So 15 of the world's top creators in this content house where we produced 500 pieces of content over nine production days. And imagine, you know, the creators are in the kitchen and they're making tacos with Harrison Barnes or Kareem Abdul-Jabbar comes in and they do a, a free throw contest. And so I think you know, it's, it's the greatest example of bringing these native creators in to collaborate with each other. I think a lot of power is there. It's not something that we've talked about. I think that power of bringing a lot of creators together, like it's when you see them in a room and I see Sammy <laughs> and uh, Sonia nodding, like their ability to ideate and dream things bigger together, just like with all of us brainstorming, like the, the creativity and stuff that comes out. So that's another thing I would give brands to consider. I know a lot of brands these days kind of have a pool of approved and vetted creators they work with and i think bringing them together to create things can be really powerful but you know really understanding you know using those consumer insights to drive how do you show up in culture and connect with you know who you're trying to reach in a way that gets them inspired to take the action that you're trying to do whether that's tune in for a basketball game or buy some oreos right and i think that's the it's the power of creativity and, and thinking in different ways yeah that's awesome um speaking of the creativity i'm loving in the chat here that everyone is giving each other advice as well so thank you alicia giving jordan some advice looks wonderful so let's move on to kind of the next phase of influencer marketing um what emerging and like brand new trends we're starting to see in the influencer marketing space and sammy we'll start with you um, well, I mentioned at the top of the call, I've been really impressed by what Mark Jacobs is doing right now because they're going a little off the beaten path. And I think they are being really creative and they're really letting, you can tell they did not give these creators a brief at all, I don't think. And I love that. I also think brands bringing creators in at the inception of the idea, not we have this product, we have this idea, what can you do? But bringing them in at the very beginning, I think is going to be a bigger trend because that's what the outcome's just gonna be better. So like, if you don't know what to do, like talk to them. They actually do wanna be involved in the process. They rather be involved in the process. And I think we're gonna see that a lot. I did see also a trend. I don't know if this is gonna actually take off. I don't know how it's gonna work. I've seen it like once, but I saw a brand who collaborated with two, oh no, no, a creator who co collaborated with two brands in one video and did like a collab post with both brands. And then the brand got to split the cost of the creator I've been talking to a lot of people if they think this is, this is 
this is a possibility. I know there's like a lot of issues, like which product gets to be talked about first, whatever. But I'm curious to see if this kind of like split cost takes off or brands can partner together with different creators. I think partnerships are going to be really big. I think TikTok is maybe um, trying uh, beta testing, having like collaborative posts. So I think we're going to see more of that, which just like what Crystal was talking about, like everyone working together more um, and having these like crossover episodes. I call them crossover episodes, LOL. Crossover episodes of like creators coming together and different brands coming together. I think it's going to be the next step. I think it's going to be really cool. Everybody I'm loves a nostalgic mashup, right? Like not yeah. to be like a uh, Gen X, but like look at the Grammys every year. The best moments are when you have like, you know, artists of the year nominees up with some nostalgic person from the Dolly Parton and, you know, whoever like that. And I think Sammy, I think that's one of my favorite things, ways of today, of like cross brand collabs, oh, creator cool. collabs, like, I don't know. It's really cool. There's a lot of power in, and more minds and, and brains on things. Yeah. For sure, I would definitely, I would echo that as well. I think one of the biggest insights we learn from Gen Zs that we talk to on a daily basis is nostalgia wins with them over and over again. Um, I think another really interesting trend that's emerging is brands that are really tapping into the digital. So like that blend of the physical and digital world and really bringing creators IRL with their audience. So for example, Alex Cooper and Alex, Alex Earl hosted an event where they rented out a bar and had a lot of their audience members come out and party with them. And I think that was a really, really exciting opportunity for their audience to feel really connected. I think a big part of creators and influencers is that their audience feels like that's their best friend and that's somebody that they've known. And so taking that transition off, or taking that relationship offline, um, I think is something that a lot of brands are looking at and the ones that are doing it, finding a lot of success in it. Sonia, I want to double click on that. Taking things from the digital world to the real world, and this is not a flex, but going to the Billie Eilish album listening party last week was like the best example where she invites in 17,000 of her most avid fans for free to come in mm -hmm. and ex have this experience collectively together as a community while everybody's also there making content too <laughs> and sharing it. And I think again, finding a brilliant, it's a beautiful insight of like, how can we then start to create, I do feel like the rise of brand experience and all of that, that kind of, you know, went dormant the past few years is coming back hardcore. And I think figuring out, especially when you're wanting to reach Gen Z, of how can we take those experiences and really bring them to life IRL and bring people together, I think is to me then that next evolution of what this looks like and really inviting people in to be together. I love Absolutely. that. Absolutely. Together again. <laughs> yeah, I think it's like, oh no, go ahead. Oh, sorry. I was just going to say, especially in a post pandemic world where a lot of Gen Zers, like we started college during the pandemic, we started you know, our first jobs, like a lot of our key milestones or moments where we would be building community in real life were taken digital. I think we're seeing this surge of Gen Zers that are wanting to really build that community in real life and take those relationships offline. So 100% would echo that. I also think it's a really great response to this rise of AI and like not knowing online what's real and what's not real and things becoming like very robotic <laughs> and if you are connecting with someone online and then you can also connect with them offline that's going to be something that is um going to maybe become more rare so i think it's like a great time to do it right now yeah for sure and um, welcome back dana hopefully the tech issues were thanks guys can you hear me now yes we can like the, the commercial yeah, perfect. Right at the end of the meeting. So I have so much time to share. But I don't know, maybe we can do another time. I don't want to take us over time. So I'm I'm here if you want to keep going, but I'm also respectful of the time limit. Sorry for those technology gremlins, folks. They're super fun. Microsoft forced an update right when I shut down. So you know how that is. Yeah. yeah. Um, awesome. All right, well, we only have a minute left, but I'm going to ask, well, to be honest, to not be political, but do you think we need to start planning for a post TikTok world? Anybody we better have been planning for it all along. I mean, I think, <laughs> that, and that's the reality. And I know no. my uh, illustrious colleagues and peers here mm -hmm. will agree. Like, if you haven't been contingency planning for a world, by the way, despite what may or may not be going on with a particular platform, you should always be thinking how do I continue to grow my footprint across the current platforms other into other things? Because look guys, like TikTok was musically in 2017. <laughs> so yep. you're not building that ever broad expansive strategy that doesn't rely principally on a, on a thing. You're kind of like 
should start doing it, but that's just my POV, but I tip to Dana right. if she has thoughts on it. Yeah, I would also say the reality of TikTok, right, in terms of that potential rate issue gives you about a year as well before it actually shuts down. So you have some time to work through some of that transition. Um, but yeah, I mean, these platforms are evolving and they're ever present and anything that's communicating with your audience, you need to be aware of, right, leveraging and ensuring that your content is hitting within it from a brand lens. So um, yeah, what's the next TikTok is the next question. And I'm sure that there's lots of answers to that one. Lots of little mini platforms kind of popping up and evolving. If anyone else, Sammy, if you have visibility to some of those, it'd be really cool to kind of hear about them. But um, yeah, yeah, I'm always looking at Reddit and Quora. And so, I don't know, there's some really interesting stuff coming. Yeah, I would say you never know who is in their parents' basement or in a garage somewhere, somewhere in the USA creating the next. 100%. Which is usually born in pandemic time, right? And so I think it's, a, it's what a lot, not to get too like techie and existential here, but like when you have those periods of mass layoffs and people kind of being forced to like figure out what's next, that's the time when building really comes on the scene and explodes. And so I think not to be predictive or, you know, in the crystal ball, but like, I think we might see some really amazing things that were born out of, you know, a few years ago that people have been working and making on. So I don't know. I'm ready. Let's see. Yeah. What you got? Yeah. yeah. It's going to be exciting. Well, look, yeah, slightly over time now, I had to skip so many questions because this was phenomenal. So maybe we'll do a part two coming up. Thank you so much for our audience because you were collaborating with each other in the chat as well. Thank you so much, my panel of Shiro's. This has been wonderful. Everybody have a fantastic afternoon. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank you.